I'll just get to the good news. Uh, this shouldn't be very long, so if you haven't had a chance to eat yet, well, you'll you'll get that. Um, and I'm afraid if I went really long, most of you would be asleep. So. Also, I've not really given this kind of talk before, so it's a new experience for all of us. And uh, so I really don't know even what to expect yet. So. Um, most of you by now have probably heard about enzymes uh, in one form or another. Many conferences talk about them and along with digestive health or the gut microbiome. Um, and most supplement companies have some sort of digestive enzyme product for sale as well. We've been doing this now for over 17 years as a company, and I've been dealing with enzymes for um, longer than I want to tell you, because then you might have some idea how old I am. Um, the thing is, is um, people can, may know what an enzyme is and that it helps digestion, but how do you get the, the most out of an enzyme product? And how, there's, there's about 20 to 25 different enzymes available commercially. How do you know which one to take? Um, so I'm going to give you some ideas and and um, plans to, to follow that might help you along that route. So to begin, you want to try to figure out what, what foods are bothering you or your child. And this can be a little of a puzzle in itself because a lot of the reactions, some of the reactions are immediate. If there's an allergy, um, an anaphylactic type allergy, you'll know right away, hard to breathe, airway constricts, and by the way, no enzyme product is going to help with anaphylactic allergies. So don't be, don't listen to anyone who, who mentions that uh, as something that enzymes could possibly help. They won't. Uh, that's a life-threatening condition. But with other intolerances, and we'll use the term allergy and intolerance kind of interchangeably, but um, I like the term food intolerance better because it doesn't get you back to the life-threatening action of an anaphylactic reaction. But sometimes the food intolerances don't show up right away. Uh, and it may take hours, it may take 24 to 36 hours before any type of reaction um, shows up. Now, if it's food poisoning, it's going to take about six to eight hours before you're going to react um, to, to any kind of food poisoning. Um, but the other signs of intolerances are a little more subtle. It may be a, a, ra a rash that appears on the chest or the trunk, um, arms, face. It may be behavioral signs. Some children may become rather hyper, or they may become very tired and lethargic. So you as a parent will know your child better than anybody. And one of the best things you can do is start keeping a journal of what, you, what your kid eats, and then just time. Like every, pick, a, pick a unit of time, three hours, four hours, six hours, and just write down six hours how they are. What do they look like? How are they acting? Are they calm? Are they nervous? Are they anxious? And keep that up for, for I'd say, up to 36 hours after, after a meal, for each meal. And then you can start seeing if there's patterns emerging to, to any particular kind of of food. Now, when children are young, you may want to keep their diet um, on the simple side, where you don't have a whole lot of different foods. And that way, that can help you narrow down which foods are, are being uh, the issue. So once, you, once you've narrowed it down to a food, and I'm just going to pick one off the top of my head, just, just say it's a um, um, let's just say the child had a spaghetti dinner, pasta with, uh, with tomato sauce on it, with a little hamburger in the, in the sauce. So you notice, say, uh, 12 hours after the meal that he's acting kind of strange. So you, and you've kept your records, and you notice every time he eats spaghetti, he reacts a certain way. So therein is your first clue, something in the spaghetti. So. That would be you've identified the food that you think is a problem. Now, what's in the food? With spaghetti, okay, you've got the pasta, which is made out of wheat. 
You've got a spaghetti sauce that has tomatoes. Um, you've got spices. You have um, hamburger meat. Um, identify what you may you may have sprinkled cheese over the uh, over the spaghetti as well. So you've narrowed it down to to the parts of that meal. Uh, again, so you look at now you look at the the individual portions of that spaghetti meal. Um, were there any other similar patterns with other meals that contained any part of that same meal? For example, cheese. If you had cheese on the spaghetti, did you have cheese on another food that caused a similar reaction? Again, that will heart that will help you start narrowing down which foods are the are the problem. Uh, you found out if he can he eats cheese with something else and no reaction. Okay, maybe it's not the cheese. Maybe it's the maybe it's the pasta. So um, again, you're just always looking for patterns in the foods that cause the problems. So now you can kind of break it down into uh, the, if you've got an idea of which food it is. Let's let's say we think maybe it's the the pasta. And uh, so okay, what's in the pasta? It's most it's mostly wheat. So wheat is a protein. It's found in grains. So uh, you're going to check out the protein-based foods. Um, are there any other proteins? There's casein is a protein, but it's also found in dairy, which has lactose. Uh, if someone is lactose intolerant, sometimes they think they're intolerant to casein. But those are two different types of foods. One's a sugar, one is a protein. If you're wanting to use enzymes to address the problem, you have to match up or pair up the right enzyme for the right food. So for lactose in dairy, it would be an enzyme that breaks down lactose, which is called lactase. Uh, if it's the protein, if it's the casein in the dairy that's causing the problem, then you need a protease enzyme, an enzyme that breaks down proteins. So again, this is where it gets a little, uh, um, a little dicey and a little confusing. But let's say for, for now, let's say it's the pasta and it's, it's the wheat. So you've identified it wheat is a problem. So now the thing is, wheat is also a combination of many other things, but the main component of, of wheat is the protein gluten. And gluten nowadays can cause a lot of problems, not just for those on the spectrum, but um, for any individual. Today's gluten is made from um, or wheat that is often genetically modified. It's harder to digest. Um, it causes issues with the neurotypical population as well as those on the spectrum. And uh, as we get older, you may think uh, you handle gluten. I'm, I'm an example. Um, when I was younger, gluten wheat products never bothered me. Now that I get older, I think gluten does. So I, being the owner of an enzyme company, I make sure that I always carry around a little packet of enzymes. So. Because uh, I'm also weak when it comes to food, and I find diets and hard, and um, so I like to take an enzyme that helps do the job for me. Um, but if you're going to do that, if you're going to be, unless you're the strong type who can do the diets, um, if you're weak like me, you're going to need a really strong blend of proteolytic enzymes. You can't just rely on one protease. You need a combination of these proteases and uh, you'll get a much better result. Also, you need high doses to make it work. Um, but with kids especially, you may want to start slowly and ramp up the dose over time because you're actually weaning. Uh, one of the peptides, uh, or some of the peptides that result from gluten and casein digestion um, are exorphin peptides, which are actually opiate in nature, will bind to the opiate receptor and produce opiate-like effects. In neurotypicals, uh, we all eat those foods and those peptides are produced. In most of us, we just, it just makes us feel good. That's where the term comfort food comes from. Uh, a big bowl of macaroni and cheese for most of us Southerners, you know, that's heaven. It just makes us feel good and makes us want to eat more. Well, that's a little bit of the, uh, of the opiate nature of the, of the peptides that are being produced. Kids on the spectrum, they tend to react inappropriately or, or in an exaggerated response to those peptides. So 
um, most times their problems tend to be behavioral. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're looking at it as a as an addict being withdrawn from from morphine or heroin, you just like that, you've got to wean them off slowly to prevent a lot of the behavioral and emotional upset. But what if the uh, what if the problem food is actually uh, not a protein but a carb or a starchy food? Well, there's enzymes that help break those down as well as too. Um, we talked about lactose intolerance, which if you reach a certain age, all of us are going to have some degree of lactose intolerance. But if you're determined to eat that bowl of uh, Rocky Road ice cream, you might want to keep um, some lactate or a lactase enzyme handy. Amylase enzyme is good for breaking down any kind of starch. So that goes a long way uh, in helping. Um, if you're on the SCD diet, um, compliance is often better when you use a carbohydrate enzyme to um, break down those complex carbs into simple sugars. And the really noticeable thing for a lot of us um, that eat a lot of carbs or starches is, is that you can, can reduce the, the bloating and the gas that occurs with a lot of these foods. Um, and with these type of enzymes, unlike the protease enzymes, you can actually start with fairly high doses of these and get them to work. In fact, low doses usually don't produce a, a visible result. <clears throat> and the third type of food that we could be uh, dealing with uh, are fats. Um, even with the spaghetti dinner, with the hamburger meat in there, you're going to have some fats included in there. But there's fats are usually not something that we're intolerant to, so you don't see a high degree of intolerance with uh, with uh, dietary fats. <coughs> you can though um, get some issues if you have a lot of fat in the stomach. It slows down the digestive process. the The stomach slows down its actions, and and it takes a lot longer for the stomach to empty. So um, that can cause some issues if you use a lipase enzyme, which is the, about the only enzyme um, known to break down fats, only there's, there's several types of lipases, but all they do is break down triglyceride fats. Uh, put them in the stomach, put these enzymes in the stomach and they break down the, the fats much quicker. One of the things about having a, a lot of fat sitting around your stomach, especially for an evening meal, is reflux and heartburn. Um, because the stomach is not emptying as quickly as it should, you can often start having um, reflux issues with that. So it's good to take if you're eating a, um, a high fat diet or if your child's on the ketogenic diet, which Im involves a lot of uh, uh, fish oils and omega-3s and that type of thing. Same thing. Those are good, those are good fats, but they can also keep the digestive system from, from operating um, optimally. So a good lipase enzyme goes a long way to help with, with that digestion. So again, uh, so you, you've settled on the type of food. Maybe it's, and you, if you notice, those last three slides all dealt with the three major food groups, proteins, carbs, and fats. So there's enzymes that deal with each food group and within each food group, there are subtypes of, of enzymes for, for proteins or different kinds of proteases to work on different type of proteins. Um, so when you, when you first try an enzyme product um, with anything, enzymes are proteins and any protein can be a potential allergen. So you want to start with a small dose and look for any signs of uh, intolerance. It's very rare and not any more common than with any other food protein, but enzymes could be, or can be a source of allergies. Um, I think it's useful to start with an enzyme product with just those enzymes you think you need. You think you've identified the food. If it's a protein, get a high protease enzyme product that just works on proteins. If it's a carbohydrate, same thing. Get those enzymes that, uh, get a product that's high in those enzymes and that'll break down carbs, such as amylase, glucoamylase, alpha-galactosidase, all these 
long, strange names. Um, the company can easily tell you which enzymes are which. Um, but this way, you'll validate your, your suspicions. Because if you're using an, an enzyme product that targets just those foods that you suspect are causing issues, then you get confirmation. If the problem resolves, you are right. And you know now that's the thing you have to work on. You can work on avoiding those proteins or those foods with those proteins. Or you can up on the enzymes to, to help make those meals uh, tolerable. If it doesn't work, then you're back, you kind of have to go back to square one. But, well, but, you've, but you've ruled out a food group. Okay, it's not a protein because these protease enzymes didn't really seem to do anything. So you go back and try a carbohydrate enzyme product. Make sure it's high in those type of enzymes. Or, or maybe it's the fats. Again, a little trial and error, a little experimentation. <clears throat> also, don't be so quick to, to, uh, to um, dismiss a, a particular enzyme product. That, oh, this isn't working. You may, want, you may need a higher dose. So again, enzymes are quite safe at, uh, at most normal common sense type of doses. And um, you want to just experiment a little, bit, a little bit higher. Usually doubling or tripling the dose you see on a bottle, it's not going to be any problem at all. You're just taking more capsules. Um, so do that. Uh, experiment with the dose. Sometimes the frequency of dosing. Um, Sometimes dosing before a meal is uh, fine, and maybe you need a dose afterwards too. And give, it, give the enzymes with at least two of the meals, breakfast and dinner optimally. I know school lunches can be an issue when you're dealing with school nurses and, and such. Uh, but try to aim for two meals a day. If you can do three meals, great. And if it's going to work, the results should show up fairly quickly. I'd say within a week And um, if you have the dose right. If you don't, then start adjusting the dose upwards. So again, let's figure out how are the enzymes helping. And uh, I know we, we get confirmation from customers all the time. Yeah, such and such product does a great job. We know it helps. We can see the difference. Um, but the thing is, all they're doing is, whoops, is breaking down proteins differently, differently than what your own body would be doing. So you only have, your body only has a set number, a certain number of, of enzymes and types of enzymes. By taking an enzyme supplement, you're doing two things. You're, you're providing a, a different set of cutting tools to break down these, these proteins and carbs and fats. Um, and also you're working, because these enzymes are acid stable, they're working further upstream in the process. Most of the time, our food doesn't encounter the, the major enzymes until it move, the food mass moves out of the stomach and into the GI tract. Um, and often, if you're dealing with peptides, that's too late because the peptides can be absorbed once they move out of the stomach. If you're dealing with an enzyme supplement of, of plant-based enzymes that are acid-stable, uh, they can work in the stomach where no absorption of, of food products really occurs and uh, you can get a head start on the breakdown. So by the time the enzymes uh, have worked on that food and have moved into the GI tract, they've done a lot of the work already. And your own body's enzymes can do the finishing work. <clears throat> the enzyme supplement you took is still working and it'll continue work till way down in the colon. So um, yeah, you're just, you're just enhancing your own digestive process. Uh, nothing magical about it. The science is well known behind it. Um, so some of the things we see we, that you can discernibly and visibly notice with a good enzyme product, um, if you're breaking down the starches, you don't have as much gassiness and, and, and bloating. Um, also, you, you see a lower glycemic response because <clears throat> you're breaking down the, the, the carbohydrates over a longer period of time. And so <coughs> instead of getting a sharp spike in blood glucose and blood insulin, you're getting a more moderated curve because the process is starting sooner in the stomach. And one thing that is absorbed in the stomach is sugar. So as sugar is produced from the breakdown of the carbohydrates, it starts getting absorbed and it's absorbed 
over the time from the transit of the food in the stomach to the, the small intestine. So that, that's better on the whole um, endocrine system uh, to, to keep sugar levels from being so spiky. <clears throat> Um, the enzyme supplements, uh, a lot of the enzymes are, are, as you see in a supplement, can be produced by probiotic bacteria, but only once after the probiotic bacteria has um, started um, feeling comfortable in your gut and is, is reproducing itself and, and colonizing your gut. So enzyme supplement is a much quicker way to do and takes out, takes out the middleman, uh, basically. So say you've done all the, um, all the food journaling and you've got your dairy and you're finding that your, your child is just reacting to a, a number of different types of foods. Um, this is when you, you may want, instead of using a targeted focused enzyme product, just go to a broad spectrum enzyme that contains all the enzymes that help with proteins, carbs, starches, fats, whatever and you're getting them all in one fell swoop. Now, in a capsule, you only have a certain amount of space. So if you're adding more types of enzymes to an enzyme product, you you're, have less room to fit all those enzymes in. So you may need more capsules. We can't, it may take two capsules or three capsules um, for a broad spectrum product to get enough in there to do, to do a good job. And this is, again, will be the, the difficult part, is finding out which all these multitude of, of enzyme products out there, which combination, which all have different ratios of the protease, the carbohydrates, and lipase enzymes, which one's going to work the best for you. The good news is that sometimes that variation isn't, isn't that important. A, a, you know, a little more of this enzyme versus a little less of this enzyme may not make all that much difference from product to product. Um, but this is why I like to push the targeted focus products because you can put more of the enzyme that you know it's going to work in a capsule. And so you're dealing with fewer capsules giving. There are some specific enzyme functions. I mentioned this enzyme, alpha-galaxosinase. This is the enzyme you find in Bino the product Bino, which helps uh, keep gas production from broccoli, beans, cauliflower, cabbage, all that uh, to, a, to a low level. So that's if, if that's your main complaint and, um, and uh, you know, if, if your wife loves to cook chili and you love to eat it and you don't like the results of eating all that chili, uh, <laughs> go with this enzyme. Uh, that's a good one. That's a marriage saver right there. Uh, gluconase is an enzyme that breaks down glucans. Glucans are find in, found in grains like oatmeal and, and other type of grain, barleys and stuff like that. Um, it can help decrease the viscosity of, of the uh, food mass and makes digestion a little bit easier. Um, we Humans, we don't make these enzymes. So gluconase, alpha galactosides, we don't we can't make that, so that's where you need uh, an in, a good enzyme supplement that'll help with, with that. Also, we don't make cellulase enzymes, so that makes it harder for us to break down fiber, um, food fiber or dietary fiber, which is the whole idea. Use, we want to eat fiber to kind of scrub out the colon and such, so we don't want it to break down too much. But a little bit of fiber broken down and, and converted to a soluble form uh, can do a lot of good and is, is actually considered very uh, nutritious. So uh, with certain cellulase enzymes can help in that. They, I don't really think there's a particular enzyme product that has cellulase that will break down fiber completely. So you get a little bit, but not all of it. And that's kind of what you want. Um, I'm a little harsh here. Maybe I, you don't have to avoid these, but bromelain and papain, they have their uses and they have their places. Um, but these are what I call the fruit-based enzymes. Bromelain is found in pineapple. It's in the fruit, but what you see in an enzyme supplement, uh, or the, the bromelain you find, you find in an enzyme supplement, is actually derived from the plant stem, from the latex of the plant stem. And the same thing with 
papain, which is derived from papaya. Um, there's is a lot more of these enzymes in the in the latex of the plant than in the fruit. So commercial enzyme producers use the latex. Now, if you have a latex allergy, these could be problematic. There may be a little bit of latex coming over from that. Um, but not everybody has a problem with that. Bromelain is a great enzyme for as an immune system modifier. So um, I like that aspect of it. For digestion, um, not so much. So a lot of companies use these enzymes, they add it to a product because when they test, uh, and these are protease enzymes, they will actually boost the, the apparent protease activity of that product and they're very stable. So this is a good way to to maintain uh, uh, active product so you, you're able to, to meet your expiration date. Um, and it's sometimes hard to differentiate whether that activity is coming from a specific protease or it's being active, added by the bromelain. Um, so again, I'm not, I'm not uh, dissing these enzymes at all, but they have their place, um, but not so much as a digestive. Um, and again, if latex issues are a problem, you might want to avoid them as, as well. Uh, there's the F word uh, that a lot of you uh, don't like to hear about, but fungal issues, um, as far as enzymes, fungal organisms are our friends. Um, most, 95% of the commercial enzymes from any company um, are derived from fungal organisms. Most of them are aspergillus enzymes. They're non-pathogenic. They're grown under controlled conditions. Um, the very first thing a producer does is they separate the solid, in, the solid uh, fungal organism away from the liquid enzyme. And then there's about a dozen more purification methods that are, are done on the enzymes. So yeah, they are derived from fungus, but there's no mold. You can't get any kind of mold infection. Um, even if you have a mold allergy, you're not gonna be allergic to the enzymes. Um, so you can rest assured that that's something. If, if they did cause mold, FDA wouldn't allow us to, to sell them. So um, these enzymes though are also acid stable um, and that's why we use them, the, their, is to kickstart the digestive process. They work under a broad range of pH, which our own enzymes, our body enzymes don't do that. So these work actually better under the acid conditions in the stomach. So they actually prefer the uh, acidic conditions of the stomach. And again, the, it doesn't matter which company you buy them from, most likely they're gonna be derived from, from fungal organisms. Um, we get to this, uh, if you're shopping around and looking, checking the s store shelves for an enzyme product, uh, milligram amounts are meaningless in the supplement box. All this means is, yeah, we put this amount of each enzyme, but that doesn't tell you whether the enzyme is active or not. So uh, if, if a producer or a company goes to the trouble of putting some kind of, um, uh, let's see, some kind of unit. Like you may not know what the heck these stand for, but it does tell you that the product was tested and found to have this much activity of each enzyme. And um, that means it's active and FDA cracks down. That's why a lot, some companies who are really not interested in, in nothing more than selling something stick to just milligrams. Because if you just stick to milligrams, then FDA doesn't care because you're not stating an activity unit, so you don't have to verify that. All you have to verify is the weight. So this means that the, the company went to the trouble to test this product and is guaranteeing this product has this amount of activity for whatever the expiration date says on it. So um, that's it, I told you it'd be short. Um, I always put my contact info, or it's a website, this is my email, Cindy Kelly, who's with me, and right over here is a uh, parent. She's also my, uh, was my very first customer some seven, 18, 50 years ago. I mean, 20, I mean, seven to 18, 18 years ago. Anyway, time flies when we're having fun. 
um, see her. She's a great resource, and um, she loves to help parents, talk to her, email her. Um, she's, she's a good person to rely on. We also got a nice newsletter. Uh, you can sign up on our website. This is our toll-free number. No, that's your, that's your work number. Yeah. Hey, call Cindy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, ask her how her day's going. Um, <laughs> no, she knows just about as much as me. In fact, I ought to get, have her get up here and do this talk. And uh, she's cuter to look at than I am. Um, so anyway, that's it. You've been a lovely audience. Um, I will be speaking tomorrow um, at 9 on the, the gut and enzymes and the microbiome. So uh, I hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Houston. Um, please enjoy the rest of your lunch break. And um, Dr. Houston will be available at his table if you guys have any further questions. Thank you.